We're there this morning. Let's go to, um, I don't even know where we're going to start. That's not good. Um, how about 2 Timothy 3? There's a number of verses we'll look at. Uh, it's going to, you know, this is not an expository study. Um, so we'll look at some verses here and there. But we've been dealing with the fundamentals of right division. And in our last two studies, we consider the different dispensations revealed in the Word of God. And again, just overview, we didn't get into it in all of its depth, but just a basic understanding of those different dispensations. Today we're going to talk about just the layout of the Bible, uh, the dispensational layout. The, Bi the Bible's not arranged chronologically, but dispensationally. And when you get an overview of the Bible and how the books are laid out, and if you keep that in mind as you study the Word of God, it'll help you quite a bit. Now to start off with, I just want to say some things about the Bible in general, and then we'll follow up with some things about the layout. But the Bible is one book made up of many different books. It has unity and diversity, just like its author. God is one God in three persons. The Bible is one book in 66 books. <laughs> so the unity does not do away with the diversity, and the diversity does not do away with the unity. It, both are true. Somebody said, you, is there one God? Yes, there's one God. You believe the Father is God? Yes. You believe the Son is God? Yes. You believe the Spirit? Yes. Well, that's three gods. No, it's one God. But he exists co-equally, co-eternally in three persons. The Bible reveals that very plainly. And so again, when we talk about the Bible... We're talking about the whole scripture, which is 66 books. Um, God used about 40 different writers with various backgrounds. who lived in different locations at different times over a period of about 1,500 years to write 66 books. And these books cover about 7,000 years of human history. And they... They give glimpses into eternity past and eternity future. And I've always said this, the Bible is not everything God knows. It's everything He wants us to know and that we need to know about Him and His plan and His purposes. And so the revelation of the Word of God was given progressively. Moses wrote uh, the first five books of the Bible and he said the... Secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things which be revealed belong unto us. Moses understood there was more coming, that everything wasn't revealed yet. Jesus, even before he died, told his apostles there was more coming. Everything hadn't been revealed yet. Well, it's all been revealed now. It's a complete revelation, but it was given progressively. But that 66 books make up one book without error without real contradiction. Now there are some differences. And some people think the differences are contradictions. They're not contradictions when you rightly divide. But there's no mistakes. This proves the Bible's the Word of God. I mean, if you took 40 different doctors over a period of 1,500 years and they wrote 66 books on medicine, that'd be the biggest mess you ever saw, okay? So there's one real author, all Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so God, it's God's Word. He used men, and, and, and it's interesting because like David has a certain style, and Paul has a certain style, and Moses has a certain style. It would be like if I had uh, this... this uh, Pigma ink. This is archival ink. This is what I use to mark in my Bible. But I have this pen. That writes differently than a regular ballpoint pen. And if I took a pencil and I took a marker, I can use all these different instruments. If I wrote with different instruments, it would look differently because they're different instruments. But I'm still the one writing. So God used men like writing utensils. And he used Paul's style. Even though the words Paul wrote in the Bible are the words of God. Um... 
Jesus Christ was God and yet he was man. God manifests in the flesh. The Bible is the word of God and yet God used men to write it. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Now, um, there are, I don't know if I should write this on the board or not, I, you may not really care about the stats, 1,189 chapters, okay, 31,101, and that depends on who you listen to, because there's still a debate <laughs> over uh, this question of exactly how many verses, uh, I think that's the most accurate, 31,101 verses, 791,328 words in the King James Bible. Um, I don't have the exact figure, but for an example, the NIV has like 60,000 less words in it. So they didn't just change the language to modern language. They removed words, tampered with the Word of God. Um. Not only did God inspire and preserve his word so that we have a perfect copy of it today in our own language, but he, I believe, led men in the proper arrangement of its books, as well as even chapter and verse divisions, so that the Bible is laid out in a divine order perfectly designed for our edification. It's exactly the way God wants it to be. Uh, chapter and verse divisions are not to be lamented. Okay, like some people, oh, this is what man did, and this is, I find it more helpful than hurtful. It enhances our ability to search the scriptures. Um, you know, in this computer age, searching the scripture is easier than it's ever been, and yet it's probably more neglected than it's ever been. I've often said this, but can you imagine back in the first century, somebody said, well, what does it say again in the book of Isaiah? Oh, uh, hold on, let me go find the scroll. And it was hard work to get out the different books and to find, and uh, you know, the way those languages were written, Hebrew and Greek, and the scrolls and the materials and just how things were. Uh, I mean, here on this iPad, I, I, I have a, 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 an app that I can just pull up whatever I want so easily, look for a word, it gives me... Everything's just, just like that. It takes a lot of work out of it. But searching, uh, comparing Scripture with Scripture, running references, uh, it's still work, but it's a lot easier today because of the tools that we have. I'm not going to do it right now. I think I've done this before, even in this series, when I was talking about the King James being a dispensational Bible. But the chapter and verse divisions, there's so many things about it that to me is not... It can't be coincidental. There's like Acts 13 is just an, a good example. It's, 13 is a separation. It's either unto bad or good, depending on the context. And, and I know that because in the first five books of the Bible, every chapter 13, there's a separation taking place. So the, there's a precedent there. And when you come to Acts 13, he said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul. And then it's in Acts 13, 13, where John Mark separates uh, from Paul, and it, it, it changes from Barnabas and Saul to Paul and his company. And John Mark was related to Barnabas, and I think he was a little offended that Paul took over things, that he had this authority now officially sent out in his Gentile ministry. And, that, you know, it just so happens that the key verses of the chapter are verse 13, verse 26, verse 39... Uh, these are all multiples of 13. Now, I think there's something to that. I would not, you know, emphasize that and make a big issue out of it, but it's, I find it interesting. <laughs> um, little things. 316. Okay, we all know John 316. Well, what about 1 Timothy 316? The incarnate word. 2 Timothy 316. The inspired word. Colossians 316. The indwelling word. Acts 14, 14 tells you there's at least 14 apostles. Okay, now Paul's not one of the 12, but there was 12, and then there was Paul, and there was Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas are called apostles in Acts 14, 14. And stuff like that I find helpful. Um, that's a text there, so that is from uh, 
well, I'll tell you later. <laughs> that was an update on something, but I won't stop in the middle of the lesson. So uh, the Bible is a big book, okay? Inexhaustible gold mine of divine revelation. You spend your whole life studying it hour after hour and never exhaust it. There's always something more to learn. And that's exciting. I feel sorry for these people who think they got God figured out. They, they know like, you know, the average preacher preaches 5% of the Bible 95% of the time. It's always the same things. But when you, now so, there are things that need to be emphasized. We ought to emphasize what God emphasizes. And the way you know you're doing that is when you're preaching it verse by verse because it keeps you in, on the right track. But there's so much in it to study. We could spend a lifetime studying it and all of its detail, never learn at all, but we should seek to learn as much as possible, not just so that we can know, but so that we can know God. Studying the Bible is not about gaining knowledge in general. It's about the knowledge of God. That's the purpose. It's the revelation of God to us. And we can only know Him and His will and how to serve Him through His Word. And so... God gave us the whole Bible. He did not just preserve Romans through Philemon for us today. He preserved Genesis through Revelation. Therefore, you ought to study Genesis through Revelation. All Scripture, look at it again. All Scripture. And it's Paul who says this in 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture. Interesting. Here's another 3.16, by the way. 2 Peter 3.16 shows you Paul's epistles are Scripture. Peter acknowledged they were Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable. So we, we're not going to throw out any of it. We need all of it. We need the whole Bible. That's why God preserved the whole Bible. So it's important in Bible study to have a basic overview of the Bible in our heart and in our mind as we study the Bible because it will help us a lot in understanding the details. In other words... Sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. If you get focused on a detail and you don't have a basic framework uh, concerning the Bible, in, you know, as far as a panoramic view and a, a survey or a synopsis, uh, you can get lost in the details. Uh, you ought to get a basic panoramic view before you start trying to study its books, its chapters, its verses, its words. And a key in Bible study is to understand the larger context. In other words, a verse needs to be studied in light of the passage it's in, and the passage in light of the chapter, and the chapter in light of the book, and the book in light of the Testament, and the Testament in light of the whole Bible, always work out to the larger context. So there is, and I want to emphasize this, because sometimes we lose sight of it, we need to emphasize right division because that's the key to Bible study. But never lose sight of the fact there is unity in the Bible. Now let me present some things to you. The Bible reveals one God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What does the last verse say? Anybody want to try it? Revelation twenty two twenty one, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the verse... The, the Bible opens with God and closes with God. Jesus Christ is God. And you learn that as you study the Bible. In other words, it starts off, the Godhead is implied in the first chapter when God said, let us make man in our own image. That's plurality. But it's fully developed. And by the time you get to the end, you know Jesus Christ is God if you believe what it says. One God. The Bible reveals one main purpose. Your happiness. <laughs> Y'all laugh because you know better than that. It reveals one main purpose, the glory of God. And true joy is found in knowing how to bring glory to God. The glory of God, that's the main purpose. It reveals one main theme. That is the person and work of Jesus Christ. He is central in all the Scripture. In John 5, 39, he said, search the scriptures. He said, they are they which testify of me. He's found in every book. He is the emphasis. He is central. You can't know the Father but through the Son. And you can't know the Son but through the Spirit in the Word of God. Okay? 
It reveals one main goal, and the goal is the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. That's really the bulk of the information, the king and his kingdom. Okay? And that, I mean, if you just look at all the verses that deal with it, that's quite a bit. It reveals one plan of redemption. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There cannot be redemption for the body of Christ or Israel or any Gentile nations without the blood of Christ. The, in other words, and some people don't like dispensationalism mainly because they think it teaches different plans of salvation. There's only one plan of salvation. There's only one Savior. But the gospel, the grace of God, wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It was first revealed to Paul, if you believe what the Bible says. But the people in the Old Testament had to have faith in what God revealed to them. Well, God knew, even though he didn't reveal it to them, that the blood of Christ was going to take away their sins, but they had by faith to bring those sacrifices to cover their sin. In other words, it's always essentially through faith. And, and let's be real clear on this, because people misunderstand this quite a bit. They say, you believe that in other ages men are saved by works. I've never taught that. And if you think I say that, it's because you're lazy in how you listen. Because I've always been very specific, it is faith that works. In other words, faith is believing what God said. So that in the Old Testament, if God said to do these things, that's what faith would seek to do. Now, we're living in the only dispensation when God says do nothing. Just simply believe. The moment you do, you're justified instantly. In other ages, God said you have to prove your faith for justification. That's what James taught. But that doesn't mean James taught work. No man's flesh can do any work that pleases God. But in the tribulation, by faith, they have to reject the beast. And by faith, they have to endure to the end. But it's still through faith. So again, listen, when it's all said and done in eternity, in the eternal state, nobody's going to be there but by the blood of Christ. Okay? But it's, it's faith in every age, but God hasn't said the same thing to man in every age. And this is where people get ridiculous. They, they claim that there's only one gospel in the whole Bible, and God's, He's always said the same thing. That's, he has not always said to him that worketh not, but believeth his faith is counted for righteousness. He said that through Paul. You don't find that anywhere else. I can show you other verses where God said, if you have faith, this is what you'll do. Prove it, you know. But again, it's the blood of Christ. Nobody can be saved by their own merit. It's by the blood of Christ. It reveals one set of moral principles. God's moral principles never change. It runs like a straight line through the book. That's why you can find applications all through the Bible. You need the whole Bible because it reveals who God is. It reveals His, His righteousness. It reveals things that apply in every age. Um, you know, you, you got the Ten Commandments. Well, uh, that's still, uh, the morality there is good. And except we're not under the Sabbath day, but uh, Paul repeated commandments as far as if we walk in the Spirit, this is the morality that will be produced in our lives. All right? It reveals one main enemy. You, you open the book and you, it don't take long and you see now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Yea, hath God said? And then you come to the last book. In Revelation 12, verse 9, it says... And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. That old serpent that was there in the garden, he's found all through the book. Uh, the Bible is the only book that will tell you the absolute truth about God and the absolute truth about the devil. And you better know both, okay? And then not only that, it reveals a harmonious unfolding of progressive revelation. There are changes, but no contradictions. 
Now, some people say, yeah, there are contradictions, and you just got to rightly divide. I understand what they mean by that. But technically, when you rightly divide, it's not no longer a contradiction. They're not opposed. In other words, if you follow the doctrine for this age, there's no contradiction there. It's when you're trying to take two things that are different and say they're both for me to follow. There are changes, but no contradictions. Well, the Bible's one book, and we need all of it. But Paul, who said all Scripture is profitable, as we've been looking at all through this series, also said you've got to rightly divide it if you're going to understand it. There are divisions in the Bible that God put in there that you have to acknowledge and you have to understand and you have to follow in your Bible study. And when you don't follow those divisions, that is the root of all heresy, isms and schisms. See, everything I've said up to now, a lot of people will say, amen. You know, the Bible's one book. It's got its unity. It's amen, amen. But when you start talking about those divisions, then you get a lot of oh me. <laughs> but just as much as, much as it's true that all Scripture is profitable, it's equally true you've got to rightly divide it. And that's getting everything in its proper place. Uh, in the context of 2 Timothy 2.15, he talked about these men who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection's passed already. They weren't denying resurrection. They were putting it in the wrong place. Uh, when you don't rightly divide the Bible and you get things out of place, it can be a real problem. It can be, in fact, the Bible becomes unprofitable and hurtful because of the way you mishandled it. A diamond ring on a lady's finger is very beautiful in its proper place. Take it off, put it in your shoe, and walk a mile and see how you feel. You take it out of place, it, it causes a problem. Now, the most obvious division is Old Testament, New Testament. You know, we know there's 39 books in our Old Testament as far as the way our Bible is laid out. And like I told you, the Old Testament doesn't begin until the blood of those animals and Moses speaking to Israel about that in Exodus but everything is headed that way. That's why I don't nitpick and have a problem with calling Genesis Old Testament. It's all pressing toward that. And technically, the New Testament cannot start until the blood was shed on the cross. But everything is headed that way when you hit Matthew 1. So, yeah, I, I don't... I don't uh, there's some guys who say, You ought to take that page between Malachi and Matthew. It says, New Testament, just rip it out. Oh, come on, you know. It's fine. Okay, just leave it. I mean, just understand the way this book's laid out. 39 books Old Testament. And by the way, Jesus Christ validated the whole 39 books of the Old Testament in three divisions, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. And he talked about the blood of Abel and the blood of Zacharias, I believe he said, which is Second Chronicles where that's mentioned, and that's placed last in the Hebrew arrangement. Ours are arranged differently for a purpose. But he covered the whole Old Testament and the, then he pre-authenticated the New Testament when he told the disciples how they would know things to come. He would show them once he left, he would reveal more. And, they, and, and so Christ himself validates the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, I don't care about what council of men decided. And all this stuff, you know, I'm not going to get into this because it's all nonsense. Somebody said the Catholics gave you the Bible. That's garbage because this Bible right here is very different than theirs. And they said, well, the Catholics decided, you ought to have the book of Enoch. Why don't you have the book? Because it's not inspired. It's not, it's not what God wanted us to have in our Bible. And by the way, don't get hung up all this crazy stuff. You got people, if you try to just talk to them about the Lord and basic sound doctrine of the Word of God, they're bored out of their mind. You start talking about the Nephilim and, the, and the, you know, all this crazy stuff. They, they, you know, all, and look, there were giants in the earth. They're called giants. I don't know what Nephilim is. I don't know. It's a different language. I'm kidding. But I, I acknowledge that was part of Satan's plan. But I'm not going to, you know, spend all my time studying stuff that's not happening today. And there's people talking about lost books of the Bible and all this. It's like all this weird stuff. Get out of the weird stuff and just study the book God gave you. Everything you need is in this book right here. Study that. And... It's been put together the way God wants us to have it. Now, again, <clears throat> you have your Old Testament and your New Testament, yet it's, it's, not, it's not correct to say 
the whole Old Testament, 39 books, is law, and the whole New Testament is grace, or the whole Old Testament was for the Jews, and the whole New Testament's for the church. Actually, only Romans through Philemon is written to the body of Christ. And so we have to understand specifics, but the general division is okay. Now, the main division, though, we've already talked about this. So I'm not, uh, not going to go over it again, but it's not Old Testament, New Testament. It's actually prophecy and mystery. Now, here's the way the Bible's laid out. And everything I'm about to give you, we've already looked at up to this point. Now, I'm trying to just put it all together in one thing. And then from here on, we're going to get in more detail of right division. We've been very general, building as we go. But basically, and I would use the lapel mic, but it's got a devil in it, so we'll have to just uh, use this here. Um, very simple. Okay? You have prophecy. But here you have the mystery. So you can take Genesis. I have eternity past, eternity future. You could take Genesis through Revelation and have a twofold division. That which was spoken by all the prophets since the world began about, his king, about the king and his kingdom, about, about Israel. And put it this way. Three main components of prophecy. Now look, I know there's prediction Paul made concerning this age. But I'm talking about prophecy revealed through Israel's prophets. It's about the earth. It's from the foundation of the world it was spoken. Christ is the king. And Israel is over the Gentiles. But the mystery given through Paul is about heaven. It was planned before the foundation of the world. Christ is the head of the body. And there's neither Jew nor Gentile. So those four basic components. Earth versus heaven. From the foundation of the world versus before the foundation of the world. Christ the king versus Christ the head. Israel over the Gentiles versus neither Jew nor Gentile. Prophecy and mystery. That's how you divide the Bible very generally. But then we looked at another division. And you remember that was from Ephesians 2. Paul's example in teaching this was time past. But now... And ages to come. Threefold division. Now, more specifically, after the rapture, there's a wrath to come. That's mentioned in the scripture. That's the 70th week of Daniel leading up to the second coming. But then you have the kingdom age and then the fullness of times. So very generally, you have time past when God made a distinction between Jew and Gentile. That started way back here with Abraham. Okay, in about two, roughly 2,000 B.C. It's interesting God flies by the first 2,000 years of human history to get to Abraham. Okay, there's a reason for that. But you have this distinction in time past. But now, there is no difference. Gentiles are being saved. Look, it was prophesied that Gentiles would be saved and blessed, but it was always through Israel. But now it's without Israel. It's through their fall, and there's no difference. We're in one body. But when the body's raptured out, then again, in the ages to come, there will be that distinction once again. All right? Gen basically, Genesis up through the early Acts, you're dealing with time past. But now is about mid-Acts through Paul's epistles. And you notice, by the way, this little line showing you a, it's supposed to signify a transition where they fell in Acts 7, and then there was a transition away. But the body be began with the revelation of the gospel, the grace of God. Now, let me, let me say this too, by the way. Christ is the beginning. I mean, he is the head of the body. So the body begins technically with Christ ascended and seated up at the right hand of the Father. But the first member was baptized into him by the gospel, the grace of God, believing that by one spirit. And that began with Paul. So you have Romans through Philemon, and then the ages to come, Hebrews through Revelation. You see how the Bible's laid out? I don't have the books written up here, but you know. Genesis through Acts, and then Romans through Philemon, and then Hebrews to Revelation. Well, all the Bible's dealing with the prophetic program concerning the king and his kingdom, except for the mystery. 
it was secret from the prophets. So they couldn't have been, you can't have that which was spoken by the prophets being the same thing as what was kept secret from them. That's what the mystery is. It was a divine secret revealed to Paul. Not a plan B because it's an eternal purpose he planned before the foundation of the world. So you have that, but then you understand how things were in time past, but how they are now and how they'll be in the ages to come. But then that's not all. Um, I think we've already dealt with this too, but remember the main goal is God putting his kingdom on the earth. The king and his kingdom is what the scripture deals so much with. Well, I'll use a different color, okay? Promised and prophesied through the Old Testament as the king and his kingdom. Christ comes, it's proclaimed. It's rejected. He's rejected. Will not have this man to reign over us. He was crucified on the cross in rejection. And where people miss the boat, for the most part, they say, well, that was it. Now comes in the church age and so on. But no, on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They were given an opportunity in early Acts here under Peter to repent as a nation, Israel, and receive their king and kingdom. So it's real. Right? But what happens? It's rejected. <laughs> Blasphemy the Holy Ghost. They rejected the Father back here. They rejected the Son. I need to get a lapel mic, man. <laughs> and uh, it's really hindering me trying to use this board too much. But it's, uh, they blaspheme the Holy Ghost in early Acts. I mean, Christ is risen. The signs are there. Everything's pointed to the fact that they have killed their Messiah and they need to repent. But in stubbornness, they continue to reject the Lord and kill Stephen with their own hands. You see, by the way, that with uh, John the Baptist, they tolerated it. They didn't say anything about his murder. With Christ, they orchestrated it, even though it was the Romans that nailed him to the cross. The Jews called for it. But with Stephen, they did it with their own hands. Increasing guilt there. So, but now, you know, God could have poured out wrath. According to prophecy, that's where everything was headed. Instead, he sat down the right hand of the Father and poured out grace. Postponed. Peter never fully grasped what God was doing through Paul. He admitted it in his last epistle. He said, these are things hard to understand. But he knew this. The long suffering of the Lord is salvation. He's explaining to his readers the reason why the kingdom hasn't come is not because God is slack concerning his promise, but that he's long suffering. And that he is through his long suffering, which Paul is a pattern of that long suffering, 1 Timothy 1. He said, if you want to understand that, you've got to read Paul's epistles. Okay? And so the kingdom has been postponed. The king is in royal exile. Next thing that's going to happen is, and that's part of the mystery of the faith, 1 Timothy 3.16, those components about the body of Christ, what's the last thing it says? Received up into glory. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, no signs, no preparation, Boom. <laughs> it's going to be just like that. It could happen today. There's no reason why it couldn't. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Then God resumes where he left off in prophecy. There is 490 years determined on Israel. 483 has been fulfilled literally. There are seven years yet to be fulfilled literally. It begins when Israel signs that covenant with the Antichrist. 70th week of Daniel, at the end of which will be the second coming, Christ establishing his kingdom in the earth. So you can say, the kingdom message then is resumed. In Hebrews through Revelation, it's established at the second coming of Christ. The Old Testament... The king and his kingdom is promised and prophesied. The gospels, it's presented and rejected. The acts, reoffered and rejected. Transition away. Paul's epistles, postpone. God is building one body. A mystery revealed through Paul. Hebrew epistles, resumed and proclaimed. Revelation, it's finally established. That's the whole theme of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
You see the second coming many times in the book of Revelation. You're taken through the 70th week several trips. And you have glimpses of his second coming throughout the book of Revelation. But it historically, I mean, the, the main climax there of the second coming is Revelation 19. All right. Um, so we'll just put up here Genesis through Malachi. It's our basic timeline. Matthew through John. Romans through Philemon. Hebrews through Revelation. That is how the Bible's laid out. Now, the last thing we looked at was the uh, dispensations, eight dispensations. And I'm not going to write, I'm running out of room. But you have innocence, we'll say Genesis 1 to 3. Again, overlapping transitions, not cut and dried time periods, okay? I've already emphasized that. But we'll say, just for sake of timeline and layout, innocence, Genesis 1 to 3. Conscience, Genesis 4 to 8. Human government, Genesis 9 to 11. Then comes the promise to Abraham. Genesis 12 to Exodus 19, the law was added. The law from Exodus 20 through the book of Acts. The mystery, that's Romans through Philemon. The kingdom is Hebrews through Revelation. And the fullness of times, Revelation 21 and 22. And that, the fullness of times is the culmination where everything's headed. It's e the eternal state. So basically, I gave you a two-fold division of the Bible. I gave you a three-fold division of the Bible. I gave you a six-fold division of the Bible and an eight-fold. And we can probably do more, but that, that, uh, that, if you will get these things ingrained, which is exactly why I repeat this, because repetition is key to learning, if you will approach your Bible with that framework, the details will make more sense to you. But if you don't have a basic overview of what you're reading, you'll get lost with the details. Now, I'll finish with this. Paul wrote the last book of the Bible. And I know that because that's what he, he said in Colossians 1.25, that he fulfilled the Word of God. To fulfill is to complete. And that's why in the last book he wrote, he said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I've pointed this out before. There's only two references to inspiration in the Bible. The first one is in Job. That's the first book ever written. It's the oldest book in the world. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Job 32, 8, I believe it is. Second Timothy is the last book. Well, it's all been given. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And... Doesn't it make sense that now that we have it all, he would then say, rightly dividing the word of truth? So the question is, well, if Paul wrote the last book, why do you have Hebrews through Revelation after that? And the reason is, is that they're dealing with things that will happen after this age. James was written, I think, probably before Paul was even saved. And, there, you know, people talk about Revelation was written in 95 A.D. like it's a guaranteed fact. The Bible does not say that. They said he was there, uh, John was, because he was being persecuted, and he was in exile under the Roman emperor Diocletian. Where, where did you get that? Now, I know he was persecuted, but he didn't say that. He said he was in Patmos for the word of God. God put them out there to get the book of Revelation. And there, there's no proof he wrote it in 95 AD. I think he wrote it during the book of Acts. But nonetheless, you, you have to understand how God laid it out. So when you approach your Bible, again, even and we're not going to get into the specifics of the Old Testament because there is a great design to that to help us as English readers because our English Old Testament is not arranged the same as the Hebrew Old Testament. It's the same books, but they're arranged differently for a reason. 
But you have this basic layout. What we do know in general is it's time past. The king and his kingdom is pro promised and prophesied. It's the time of prophecy. Okay? But when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, now the kingdom is being proclaimed. It's at hand. And yet he's rejected. The renewed offer is given in early Acts. Then you move into when they fall as a nation. You, you move into the mystery revealed through Paul. The king and his kingdom being postponed. That's but now Romans through Philemon. When we're caught up, that's where Hebrews through Revelation is going to find its fulfillment. Now, you can get some applications out of all the Bible. But you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to end up making some wrong applications if you don't understand the context where everything's found. Now, probably in another lesson, I'll give you the order of Paul's epistles because they're not arranged chronologically. They're arranged for a very specific reason the way they are. And we'll probably look at the, that later. But that is, that's the dispensational layout to the whole Bible. Again, we can get more specific and break down the Old Testament and we can get more specific and break down the New Testament. But that's the general overview of how the Bible's laid out. And if you'll keep that in mind as you study, it'll help you immensely. Father, thank you for...